Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi, Michael. Hi, Michael. Hi. Hi. Nice. That'd be great. Uh, we're going to go live. So if you'd like to uh, uh, just mute yourself when we, uh, when we start. Okay. It's okay. All right. And, okay. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, going live now. And uh, today is uh, Poems in Speech Live with the, uh, the Thursday uh, Night uh, Poets. And uh, with the, uh, they have a uh, chapbook that's called uh, I don't think I did this right. And uh, we just want to, uh, and, and I actually did it right too, which is good. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> nice. And yes, and there it is, I got it too. And uh, so I would like, what we're going to uh, let uh, uh, either uh, Katie would like to go first, or uh, Brendan would like to go first to talk about uh, how you started, uh, how you started working with uh, this group, because this is, uh, you know, we have a little group here, and uh, your your group is really uh, I love. I, I joined it last a uh, couple months ago, and uh, really enjoyed being there too. So I think our group would uh, love about like to know about it too. So. Um, well, maybe I can uh, maybe I can set up uh, some context for you, and then uh, Katie okay. can take it away. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> as uh, Mark said, uh, my name is Brendan Constantine, and I'm a poet uh, here in Los Angeles. And uh, I was really uh, very lucky to uh, meet this group. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Jerry Hepner uh, had reached out to me. And uh, because he knew that I'd been working with uh, a group of writers that have aphasia here in LA. And he was curious uh, if I wanted to visit uh, this regular Thursday night group that he was hosting. And these were just, uh, these are uh, folks, uh, you know, uh, from all walks of life uh, who share uh, a common experience of traumatic brain injury. And the, uh, you know, and all of the sort of syndromes that that can result in, you know, everywhere from, you know, uh, aphasia to chronic pain to any number of other constraints. And we started uh, doing uh, poetry together. Now, I should tell you that right now there's, you know, I mean, I'm sure you already know this, but there's no, um, uh, there's no uh, clinical discipline for specifically teaching poetry workshops to people who are dealing with language processing constraints. Uh, there's some research out there that suggests this would be a good idea, but nobody has ever sort of published uh, a procedural for doing this. Nobody's, nobody's designed a class for like, this is how you do this. Mostly, of course, because every experience of aphasia is different. And uh, so it's, it would be very hard to sort of st systematize one approach. But I got to work with this group and uh, they uh, immediately started blowing my mind. They were, you know, I would give a suggestion for a prompt or an exercise. They would immediately take that exercise in their own direction, which is what you always hope as uh, a workshop leader. You don't want to just you know, create exercises where everybody produces the exact same thing. You know, you want them to have enough room to feel like they can, they can make the exercise their own. And that's what these uh, poets did. And you're gonna hear today from my friends, uh, Catherine and Sherry. Um, and, uh, you know, they took me very seriously when I said early on, I love a rule breaker. You know, you know, I can, you know, I'll say, okay, this is how you should start writing your poem and maybe try to try to, you know, follow these parameters. And they would take what I suggested and they would make it work for them. 
instead of them working for it. And, uh, and always, you know, and I, and I really think that's very important moving forward. If you take a poetry workshop, if you take classes anywhere, you know, uh, always remember that you have the freedom to make this your own. And, th and that's what you should do. The work will be the most interesting, you know, if it has your voice. So, um, so I began to work with these uh, writers and uh, they responded amazingly. They started to churn out really good poetry. And we noticed <clears throat> that a couple of things were happening. You know, um, most of them had not taken poetry workshops before and they weren't sure what to make of me. Uh, and uh, as I said, they would adapt the exercises uh, to their own skills and to their own desires to express something and would routinely come back every week and say, you know, I don't think I did this right. And I noticed that every time somebody said, I don't think I did this right, they did something amazing. The work was really, really good. And so I really loved hearing. I mean, whenever anybody came and said, I don't think I did this right. It's like, okay, I know that means they're going to do something really interesting, you know. And uh, the next thing we knew, the group had piled up so much work, they had so much poetry that they were creating, that we thought we should put together a book. Now, I think originally we thought what we would do is put out a book, a big book that would tell people how to have poetry workshops, specifically for writers that were dealing with TBI, that were dealing with aphasia, that were dealing with any you know, language processing constraint. But we thought, okay, that could take a very long time to produce a book, a big book that had lesson plans in it, that had testimonials, that was peer reviewed. And this, I could tell this group of poets was really eager to start putting their work out into the world and sharing it with other people. So we said, why don't we do what's called a chat book? A chat book is a smaller version of a, of a complete manuscript of poetry. And poets have been making chat books uh, for a long time. They're usually a homemade book. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you know, we did have uh, some money to put together and we realized that we could do a chat book of work by these poets uh, and actually have it nicely produced, uh, that we could get it produced with, you know, good binding and a nice glossy cover. And, uh, and we could make something really interesting. Well, what do you know? They put together a great book. We, uh, Mark has a copy, he showed it to you earlier. It's called, I Don't Think I Did This Right. <laughs> uh, Katie's holding up. One up. <laughs> and there's no stopping this group. They're already working on their next book. And I think that's enough out of me. It's probably time we heard from some of the poets. Um, uh, either Catherine or, or Sherry can take us into the next part. Catherine, how are you feeling? I'm I'm handing it off to Sherry. She's got some words. Oh, fantastic! So it's you know so yeah. Let's hear uh, let's hear from uh, Sherry now. Hi everyone. I'm Sherry, and I think I've seen most of you before. I've had the pleasure of attending your group poetry and speech now for a few months, and I've enjoyed it. Um, I got my first start in poetry through the Thursday night poets, which was in November of 2020. And what started out as going to be three classes has morphed into every Thursday night now for what, two and a half years, I think. So uh, yeah, it's been interesting, especially for me. And I'll, I'll get more into that later. Um, we published our first book in summer 2021 and we've since sold about uh 450 books and it seems to keep flying out the door so that's been good we i didn't every... know we'd sold that many that's amazing yes we have <laughs> we we sold all the first ones we published and then we published our second printing so but we meet every thursday night by zoom and so far we've had two poetry readings we presented. The first one was at the GOAT, which was an oak, a local um, venue here. We're from, we started in, well, Brendan's from California, but Katie 
Well, and Katie lives north of here and I live south of here, but we started in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, but it's always been by Zoom. We started up, I think it was during the pandemic. So we've never met in person. But um, so the first one was at the GOAT and the second one we did at through Beyond Baroque, which is a literary center out in California. And they are dedicated to expanding the public's knowledge of poetry and through mostly through cultural events and community interaction. I think I have that right, Brendan, do I? Okay. Um, we're working more, we're, now we started to work on our second book, which probably will be out within the next month or so. Wow. And Katie will talk to us more about that later. So, uh, did you want me to start with the poems, Katie? Sure. Um, right. I'm going to screen share for everybody. So if it's easier for you to read along as Sherry is speaking, we have that available for you. Oh, okay. that would be great. Just give me one moment. Can everybody see that right there? Yes. Yes. Is it big enough? Yeah, it's fine, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. All Good. right. So this poem was um well before before I joined Thursday Night Poets, the absolutely the only poems I knew were nursery rhymes. And you know, I said so I heard a lot from my mother when I was little and I told a lot of them to my daughter when she was little. And then a stark realization came, came to me through this group is that musicality was present in every poem, anywhere from the rhythmic patterns to the capture of experiences, emotions and the images. And every song was a poem. I never realized that songs were made from poems. I knew absolutely nothing about it. So, and then it also made little sense to me, all poems, they didn't make sense to me. But then I realized that poets don't write to be understood by others. They write to express themselves. So I still spend most of my hours watching and observing other poets with little participation. I did not write my first poem. I could count on one hand how many poems I wrote the first year. Most of them came out of free rights, which Brendan gave us at the beginning of each session. So then one, one night he gave us the assignment to do a one-line poem. And I got up and I walked out of my office here and it came to me just like that. And I titled it Learning. And this is it. Lurkity, lurkity, lurk, lurk, lurk exclamation point. And that totally describes how I was with the poetry group. And actually, I kind of still am. I lurk and I learn. <laughs> you do more than lurking, Sherry. <laughs> well, not really. I, well, it, in, in January, Katie took over our group for a month. And mm. in her honor, I wrote poems. So I did get two a week, eight of them in then, more than I had written before ever. Right. So, okay, the next one. Okay. Oh, this is me. Oh, that's yours. Yep. We're going to go to this one. Okay. And this one I wrote when I was um, a long time ago, still in college, and they raised my rent. I bought an old house out in the country. And uh, no one had lived there for a long time and it didn't have any plumbing or anything. Did have a three hole outhouse. But anyway, I wrote this about that. So my address there was Route 7, Box 203. <laughs> it started as a stagecoach stop deep in the countryside. Now a homestead on Maple Road immersed in the heart of Pleasant Valley. Five bedrooms up and down, beautiful wood trim, wallpaper delight. Doors everywhere, seven in the dining room alone. No heat, no plumbing. 
a staid relic from a far-flung time with a storied tradition, one nearly as old as the surrounding forest. The walls bloom with delicate blossoms. Floral essence brings life into the home, a rush of hopeful charm. No person has lived there in years. Three generations have come and gone. Everything is still the same. Now I am here. Am I alone? Mm. Something is upstairs. Gentle movement can be heard. A lingering present is nearby. At first, I don't know you. I only feel you. Are you a friend of this house? Will you give me your name? Bright new sunshine cascades through the air each day. Your purple lilacs and irises fill the yard with a beauty so rare. The dancing northern lights playfully interrupt the dead of night. Your presence has become a daily comfort. Love fills my every step as I watch for you. Suddenly, there you are silently watching out the upstairs window under the gable. A fine lady, very interested but peaceful, standing serenely at the window, unforeboding. Then you calmly move away and disappear. Any fearfulness has long left me. I must go now. Someday I will join you again, forever. In this house, in these gardens, we will share this peaceful haven. Mm. Wow. You as scary. And everything in there is true, actually. I didn't really make anything up. Brendan encouraged me to write about, I don't know what ghosts or something came up. And, you know, and it's like I lived with the ghost and I did. And the house had been vacant for three or four years since she died. I mean, the furniture, everything was still there. They just, Shut it up. So anyway, that's Casper that. The ghost. Casper the ghost. You know, it wasn't Casper. <laughs> it was an older lady. Okay, then I have one more. Ready for your other one? Yes. Give me a second. Okay, and this one I wrote in response to my injury. And through my injury, I lost the use of most of my right side. And I wrote this in response to that. <clears throat> and it came from a prompt that Brendan gave us, I think. He's given us good prompts. And the only, I cannot, I can't seem to write poetry unless I have a good prompt. My hands remember <clears throat> how they once operated. In tandem, they worked side by side, right hand dominant, left hand never far behind. Off they journeyed every morning, school, then work, and finally play. Always together on sunny days, on dreary days, without fail. Their prowess at the keyboard was unlimited, speed and accuracy absolute. Together they zipped along the shiny keys, polishing off each document page by page. Boom, one big hit. Right hand useless, left hand always ahead. Now they are one. The right hand gets its thrills now from watching always watching Ooh. thanks wow. everyone uh, and i think now yeah. we're going to have katie present to us and katie has been an inspiration to our entire group because mm -hmm. she always had something to say and I have to say, when she took over in January of this year was when I finally started to write. So, and it's been good for me too. So, 
yes. Now you've sort of created a monster in me. <laughs> I, owe it, I owe it all to Katie. Mm -hmm. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. None at all. Um, so poetry for me, um, a little bit of my backstory was uh, I've got a brain injury in December of 2016. Uh, I fell on black ice and had a subarachnoid hemorrhage and a skull fracture. Um, I, like all of the rest of us, have had recovery up and downs, um, but one of my major ups has definitely been poetry. Um, I never wrote before. I was always a big reader, but I never wrote anything. I didn't journal. I got good grades in English and such, but I really don't remember any poetry from high school or grade school. Um, so my background was nil. <laughs> uh, when we decided to start this, Jerry basically sent out um, a email and said, we're gonna have this guy from California that I've met <laughs> that does this thing. Do you wanna come? <laughs> and I was like, uh, well, okay, it's the pandemic. And honestly, I'm bored. It's a Thursday. I have nothing else to do. No offense, Brendan. Uh, but that's exactly why I came because I was, I was bored. And uh, the first poem I wrote was abysmal, absolutely terrible. I have no idea what I was even thinking. I read it now and I cringe. Uh, <laughs> but Brendan saw something in me and under his guide, guidance and um, just his encouragement and everyone in the class's encouragement, it's really um, opened something in me that I never really thought was going to be there again. When you have a brain injury, you lose a lot of stuff. And one of the things that I lost was my career. And after doing it for 20 years, mm. it feels like a part of you. Mm -hmm. So when you lose it, mm. you know, that's a big chunk that's gone. Um, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be your career, but I think everyone understands the, the sense of loss that you can go through. Um, poetry for me has, has given me back somewhat of an identity. I can call myself, uh, I, I'm not a, a person with a brain injury anymore. I can say I'm a poet, um, which still really honestly blows my mind. But <laughs> um, when we started writing, I didn't know how to write um, anything more than from my experiences. Um, so most of the poems in uh, the first book that we've had, um, the poems that I wrote are all basically based on true true stories or true, there's some truism in my entire life in there. So uh, I'll pull up my screen here and I don't even remember <laughs> which poem I have up first. So give me just a second. Okay. Can everyone see this one okay? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. So this one is called Cover Your Ears. It's um, one of the first I wrote about my brain injury. Um, and for me, writing about my brain injury has been nothing short of cathartic. So I deal with tinnitus on a 24 seven basis. Um, so, I named it, Cover Your Ears. Some days victorious, some days beaten, I emerge. 
I have no choice but to go on. I fight the battle. It eats at me at times. I fear it may swallow me whole. More distracting than a teenager's phone. A blaring TV when you are having a serious discussion. A massive car wreck on a busy highway. Rubbernecks galore. In a silent room, it's worse. Nothing ever drowns it out. Even asleep so deep, you feel as if you are paralyzed. Drool on your pillow. A squealing microphone, the feedback so loud, you cover your ears and cower. One million screaming cicadas, whining of electrical wires rising and falling, nails on a chalkboard. Mm. Um, I'll just scroll right down to my next one. Um, so this one I call Day is Done. And it's based on a combination of my uncle's funeral and my grandfather's funeral. Day is done. We got all dressed up, our special shoes and everything. There were lots of cars and people milling about. He was in the service, they said. What did he service, I wonder? Did he fix tractors or lawnmowers? Or was it washing machines? How do you service a washing machine anyway? Some people crying, some telling jokes I didn't understand. Mostly people just stood there somberly. Heaps of hugging and handshaking. I clung to my mother's skirt, her shadow for the day. There were even snacks in the back room. I thought I was special because I got some. We were there for a long time. And then finally everyone clumped up outside like snowbanks during a blizzard. There were men in uniform, trumpets, and something called the 21 gun salute. But I didn't see any of the gun salute. I had learned how to salute from my daddy. He was in the war too. Even though I didn't understand, tears fell from my eyes when the trumpet wailed. My daddy called it taps. Strangely though, I didn't hear any tapping. Oh, that's so beautiful. So be Reminds me of John F. Kennedy. You know, wow, it's really beautiful, really beautiful poem. Thanks. Um, I want to for sure leave enough time for questions and answers. I have one more. Do you want me to read it? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody says yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> Mark's the boss, so what Mark wants, Mark gets. <laughs> Within reason, Mark, don't go too wild. All right, this one is called History. Um, so I'm gonna read it and then I will give you the backstory because I think it's more powerful once you know the backstory. Without this awful lullaby, would this life be different? Forever it haunts me, almost more than I can take. Take my lifeblood, add mind-numbing loss, wasted potential, more than one dream shattered. A few months, five high schoolers, actions setting off a chain of events nobody saw coming. I could have tried to stop them if I knew what was coming. He turned to hand me his test. A, of course, history changed. Mm. Um, so this this mm. poem is actually about 
when I was in high school, um, we had five teenagers die within three months of each other. And I went to a really small school. Um, and then in the same three months, my grandfather passed away. Um, so the person that I'm talking about in, in the poem, his name was Travis and I sat behind him in history. Uh, he and his girlfriend committed suicide late on our Friday night. And that Friday I had graded his class paper in history. And of course he always got an A. He was really smart. Um, he was just, it was just a lot. It was a lot for mm. our, our little high school to handle. So that was my take on trying to come to grips with a lot of that. That's what my poems are, is me trying to come to grips with a lot of my experiences. So mm. I'm really excited about our next book. Um, that's gonna be coming out, Sherry, I think mentioned in hopefully the next month or so. And Mark is going to be part of that. And so is Cindy. Yes. Um, and so is Michael, actually. So yes, Michael. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really excited that the, our next uh, book is called Poetry is Chocolate. Ooh. Which sounds weird, but <laughs> <laughs> once you uh, read the poem, where it came from, it, it makes complete sense. This book is uh, more based on all of our poems about our brain injuries or our strokes or aphasia. Um, it's completely different from our first book, but it's perfect in, in my opinion, it's, it's a perfect way to follow up. You know, we started with easy peasy <laughs> poems and then we got into some prompts that drug up some memories and then we're starting to get deeper and deeper. And now all of a sudden we're trying to analyze our lives around our mm -hmm. in injuries. And this was the result of it. So a lot of blood, sweat and tears, <laughs> but. Um, Catherine. Did you, try this, did you try this poem called um, Coal Smoke, C-O-A-L, Coal Smoke? Is that oh, yours? Yes. That, that is yours? Yep, that's me. Wow, that's really good. You're very uh, Yeah. Thank you. Um, so this was actually, it's kind of funny. It's not part of the book at all. Uh, a lot of what I did when I was recovering um, was puzzles, word puzzles, uh, jigsaw puzzles, mm -hmm. brain, brain work puzzles, they called it. A lot came from my speech therapist right away. Um, but as I was getting better and uh, I was able to do a little bit more um, advocacy for myself and look into things, um, I began to do jigsaw puzzles, which I had done before, but never with like this obsession <laughs> that I had. Uh, I just loved puzzles because I feel like, I think it just takes my brain and shuts off the part that is, it's too much. Um, and so I don't know, Brendan and I were talking about puzzles one day. I not exactly sure even what the what the premise was but he he was like hey since you like puzzles why don't you try this and he sent me an example um richard shelton's from a room which if you look it up uh, i can put it in i can put it in the chat it's to me it doesn't make a lot of sense <laughs> I read it and I was like, you want me to do what? <laughs> but of course I do what we do in Thursday Night Poets and I don't make things right. So I did my own take on it. And honestly, 
uh, there you go. Um, when I wrote it, it took me about 15 minutes and I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but I sent it to Brendan and I was like, <laughs> was this what you wanted? And he was like, oh my God, I have to tell you. <laughs> yes, I, I kind of lost my mind. Uh, <laughs> And what's interesting too is, if you don't mind my interrupting, I just but yes, but Katie, no, perfect. Catherine is not going to brag, and I think uh, there's some bragging due. Um, you can actually try uh, a prompt based on Shelton's poem yourself. I mean, he did. He starts his poem with like a five or six line stanza, and he has some. He makes a point of using lots of nouns, verbs, and modifiers. You know, the, the first stanza is really vivid. He tells you about, you know, the sounds and colors that are coming through his window. He's telling you about, uh, you know, a telephone ringing in his apartment while this is happening and this, the fragrance that is coming through the window. He tells you all of this in, in the first stanza. In the second stanza, he repeats what he was saying, except he changes what's making sounds, what's creating a smell, what's, you know, and what can be heard through the window. So suddenly, you know, it's the smell of the telephones and it's the sound of the trees ringing outside. And he just sort of, he sort of switched places with everything that was doing one thing in the first stanza, then he has, he has them sort of switch roles and then he does it again in the third stanza, he does it again in the fourth stanza. And I, you know, that was the model I showed uh, Catherine. Well, Catherine writes this really interesting poem. And unlike Shelton's, Catherine still makes sense by the end of the poem, even though she's really effectively switched the roles of things, you know, the actions that things are supposed to be, be capable of, the things that we normally associate with, you know, the way smoke behaves, the way our thoughts move on a given day. Um, you know, and she really turned it into her, she turned it into her own uh, poem. But I mean, if you wanted a good prompt, I mean, you really could just start writing a, a very simple stanza about something you did today, a sound you heard, a, you know, a smell you perceived, something you touched. And then in the next stanza, just change the roles of who did what, you know, and then do it again in the third stanza and do it again in the fourth stanza and see what you get, you know. Um, it may not make practical sense, but it might make emotional sense. And uh, Catherine is a, Catherine is a whiz at getting you know uh, you know finding the emotional connection in whatever she writes about. Anyways, that's enough out of me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's in the chat. Yes, it's... I will I will share that or 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 I'll copy it. And share to the uh, to the group about you that. You can find it in uh, it's it was published in in Rattle. Oh, nice. But I can forward a copy to you as well. Okay. You Thank to, you. As long as um, as well as if you want the other poems that I uh, I have to write down the note right now because. <laughs> Uh, I, I would like to say that, uh, you know, with when you started doing poetry uh, and you were writing about your situation, uh, you know, you talked about uh, the first uh, poem that you just read about the uh, electricity. Uh, you know, you could I could hear that when you were saying that I because, yes, my. My right side is all affected. All the senses are affected. And uh, uh, electric in my ear, you know, it's, I can feel it. I can feel it. I can, I can sense it. It's really when you're writing, uh, I, I, you know, so the things that uh, when I started doing poetry, it was trying to figure out what was going on what happened to me and it just felt like something else you know it felt some felt something you know and, and i wanted to write about it but yep. thank you you're welcome thank you does anybody have any questions at all for 
Can everybody talk at once now? Uh, just one, Kathy. I mean, I find these poems so powerful, so beautiful. I mean, your writing is so clear and beautiful. Uh, that's, I, I guess that's the only question I can say is you really write about it, really comes in deep. And you have these poems, these, these poems from traumatic brain injury, you're still able to, to pull out these ideas on the word and write these beautiful poems. You seem very sad and then you write these poems and I can hear it through with these poems. And I'm gonna thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's been quite the process. Yeah. <laughs> I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gotten here without Brendan and Jerry. I thank them probably every other week just for the entire experiences that we've had in the readings. And I mean, we're all poets and for the love of Pete, how many people can say they have a book? Well, now we're, we're gonna have two books and there's so <laughs> many other opportunities that we're all working yeah. It's just crazy to me. I feel like I was meant to write poems. I read words differently. I see words differently. Um, I hear words from people differently. It's just weird. People say stuff and I'm like, oh my God, I gotta do a poem about that. So I have a few poems. Many of them have not been shared. But... So do you have published, you have published poems? Um, I do, I have poems in Rattle, which is a publication out in LA. Um, and then I also have, we have a local, um, it's called volume one um, here in, in Eau Claire. And did they publish a poem or just an article about our book? I think, Sherry, you're on mute. I, I, I don't, it was I think it was poem. just an article about us, not. I think they published an article about us and then if I remember right, they also have a volume one. Well, volume one is like a, a local feel good type magazine that tells you everything that's going on in the Chippewa Valley here. And Katie wrote a poem and they published it. And I think what they published with your article, her, her article was about the book. And I think what they did was they did not publish a poem in the written copy, but in the online copy, they published one of my poems, if I remember right. Yeah, I, I don't But that, my poem was only online though, in the online version, it wasn't in the published version. Yeah. But they do have a lot of poetry in there. Yeah, they have, they have um, um, a, a actual brick and mortar store that you can walk into and buy local products. And so our book is there as well. But, um, and then I've published from, I don't know if anybody um, has heard of TBI Hope and Inspiration. It's a website uh, from David and Sarah Grant. If you look it up, um, for me, he talks about his experiences as a survivor and his feelings around it and everything that he's been through. And I, it just rings true to a lot of my feelings. And so I'm a huge follower of that. I can send that to Mark too. Um, but I, I have a poem in the spring of, must be 2022, spring of 2022 version. Um, my poem, Empty Bottles, is in there. So honestly, I've not really tried to publish too much of my work. Mm. But I feel like somebody kind of wants me to publish more of my work. <laughs> <laughs> um, Catherine, Catherine, I really believe you'd have things, poems. I really believe his poem can be published. And uh, on here, on chat, my um, poetry was, was released in uh, September of 2021. 
but um, I'm writing now on a book about Stroke Across America. I really believe that if you write some poems together and send them out, it's worth it. It's worth to read about them. It's, it's a beautiful idea about traumatic brain injury. That's very different from aphasia in a lot of ways. And to read about aphasia or traumatic brain injury in Stroke Across America, you can learn something about it. You can learn about what it is. It's really, really beautiful. And I just love, I, I, I published my poem because I, I said to my wife, I want to get some of these words out. And it's still getting published. There's still people who are reading it and sending it out to uh, Amazon.com. And I think that if you put together some poems, I mean, people don't read about that. So many people don't know this. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I I I have I have some talking to a certain person to do. Well, I'll just say that whether you believe it or not, I love that your poems are out. I think it's wonderful. Fifteen participants, you read these really brilliant, powerful, poignant poems, and I'm going to thank you for doing that. If you can do more, it's wonderful. If you can't, it's okay. But mm -hmm. I'm really proud of the chance to read them. So thank you. And uh, make sure that uh, uh, any can you uh, uh, share uh, how to get the uh, chapbook because everybody should if you don't have one you should get one and uh, so how can they how can they get that? Ooh. Well, the easiest is probably to just uh, send Mark, everybody has his email address, send Mark a message and say, I'd really like a copy. I have about eight of them left out of the four. Yes, yes, yes. yes. If, if we don't um, get to everybody who wants a copy, I, I there has been discussion to have another uh, printing made, but doesn't doesn't Jerry have any left? Well, because we're going to do that brain injury conference in May, I think they are going to that. Okay. Well, I have a few here too. So be between Jerry and I, we'll probably be able to get you a book. Um, so just send send Mark your uh, name and address, and that you'd like to um, buy a book, and then maybe Mark, you can. Just compile those all into one email. Yes. Okay. We have a Venmo account. I don't know if everybody knows what Venmo is, but it's kind of like you open it on your phone. It's an app on your phone and you can just directly pay. I will put in the chat our um, our handle. It's at Thursday Night Poets. And... One word. And one thing I want you to know that uh, because I have, we have a, a group for uh, poems and speech, but I have another group for uh, the Mid Atlantic uh, Aphasia uh, Conference. I, I'm going to, I usually share that stuff with the, that too, but I want to uh, share that. Uh, when we have, I'm going to have a video from this and I'll share that to, uh, they're all, you know, people, uh, different, uh, like, uh, hospitals and, uh, and, uh, rehabs and stuff like that. I email those about that stuff. So, okay. We, yeah. we do have an email, um, that depending on how many books come in, um, we can we we have graduate students that we work with and let me just double double triple check our email address but um that would be another way that you could get it so but if you let mark know and if you mm -hmm. need to write if, if venmo is not something that you're comfortable with if you feel like you need to write a check i don't know where all y'all live if you want to send the check to me that's not a problem or if you want to just send the <coughs> check to Mark, because I know he has a Venmo account, um, yes. whatever is easier for you guys. Um, Katie, yeah. um, you were teaching poetry 
a um, few months ago, and I learned a lot from you. Oh, okay. Yeah, like nice. a teacher. <laughs> really I she, was, she was a wonderful teacher, Cindy. I agree. She yes. got me to write poetry. Yes. <laughs> That's saying a lot. I, um, maybe you can be a poetry teacher. Uh, I don't know that I could be a poetry teacher. I've already mm -hmm. tried to talk her into it. Oh, really? I think yes, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep her. Brendan is a better teacher than I am, for sure. Uh, I enjoy the. Okay, the we're, we're getting into some territory here. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Personally, and I was just saying this to a group uh, yesterday, I feel like if you've taken two poetry workshops, you can teach one, you know, and uh, I mean, because you probably, you know, you probably have some experience, you know, I feel like if you've got two workshops behind you, then you have a sense of what goes on in a poetry workshop and you have probably at least two or three good prompts that you can offer somebody else. And of course, all you need is one. Uh, but I say, okay, if you've done two workshops, then you know, then at least you have a plan A and a plan B. And uh, and I do think that uh, in order to have a poetry workshop, that doesn't mean you have to work with ten people. I mean, I think you, I think two people can have a poetry workshop. You know, and if if you know if you know anybody that's having trouble writing, you know, or if they feel they're jammed up, or they've got writer's block, or they don't know how to start. You know, if you help them at all, that's a poetry workshop, you know, and, you know, I mean, you, you know, say, well, let's start doing it like this and then see, see what happens. And I think it's a good thing for poets to be doing. I really do. I mean, I think it's one of the ways that we can earn our keep, you know, and uh, is, you know, is we, we, we write our own poems, we do our best job with that, and then we help other writers. But that's, so I think I I agree. I mean, I not only do I think Katie could lead a poetry yeah. workshop, but I know there's a few people in this room that have been to quite a few poetry workshops too. Mm -hmm. And you could teach workshops if you were interested in doing it. Anyway. <laughs> Katie, yes. um, that one time you helped Naomi um, wrote her poetry is in, in a rose. Mm -hmm. you know, it looks like a rose. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. I just, <laughs> Brenda, I just, it's, I have that, <laughs> uh, I have that ability to look at it real easily. Yeah. See that. I've done one um, with a pair of running legs. Mm. It's a poem about my dog yeah. that got out and I chased after him and yelled at him a lot, but I love him so much. Um, so I did running legs and I've also done one in the shape of a camera. So um, it's, it's easy for me to see, see yes. images like that, but um, well, you need to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll uh, you'll see me again, I'm sure this year. So <laughs> I am available for rent if y'all know, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, the book is... Um, the book is ten dollars, and shipping and handling is four dollars. So it'd be fourteen dollars total for anybody that would like to. Okay. Uh, uh, we we could uh, we could talk uh, a little bit more if you like, uh, but I'm going to uh, uh, stop the uh, uh, yeah. uh, Facebook live so I want to say thank you everyone and uh so I want to stop I'm going to stop that in a second and then we could still talk if you like uh I need I can stop it somewhere thank you very much oh, yeah it stopped in, our, in your chat yeah it's it stopped already Oh, it's, it's, it still says live, doesn't it? It's live. 